tonight we are presenting on running an injury prevention. So this is not a workshop of how to teach you how to run properly and be an amazing sprinter or anything like that. It is not designed sort of like what running coaches would do and how to teach you how to run. This is simply about how we find injuries in people that are having problems, um, how we go through assessment, what we do for injury prevention, and what exercises that we do to try and help that person recover. So we'll split into three sections today. First one, Claire's gonna present. She's gonna go through some running postures and techniques of how breaking down the running cycle and going through some common injuries that happen through biomechanical faults. Then we've got Elise who is gonna show us how we do our running gait assessment. And the good thing about this, we've got a, a patient that we videoed and so we're gonna show you live with video how we look, break down that person's running gait and show you what's going wrong so you can see what we do um, for an assessment. And then I will round it off and show you some tips for good running form. So the ideal sort of situation you want to be in when you are running to help with injury prevention and then going through some strength and mobility exercises as well. So jam-packed session today and hopefully we'll get it done in an hour. All right, so I'm going to hand you over to Claire and she is going to um, go through the first section. First of all, I think it's really important to actually break down running biomechanics. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, yeah, a normal running pattern. Um, but yeah, I think it's really uh, a good kind of foundation for you guys just to understand a little bit about what happens when we're running, what's happening during the running cycle. So there's a lot of evidence that indicates um, that a lot of running related injuries actually have a really high recurrence rate. Um, so understanding some biomechanics and potentially stuff that's going to be causing um, injuries is really important for obviously identifying what's actually going on and a proper fix to the solution. Um, there's a lot of different risk factors as well that come into play when we think about running, running training programs. Um, I think, yeah, really trying to um, think about previous injuries that um, you might have had. Um, your training volume, some of your training goals, they're all also really re relevant factors to be thinking of. Um, yet, regardless of your experience with your running, um, regardless of, uh, yeah, your training goals that's going on. So, one of the most important risk factors for a running injury um, is actually a previous injury. So, um, yeah, as we kind of break down the running cycle, you'll start to see a little bit more about, um, yeah, why again, kind of identifying what's going on is going to be really important. Um, little fun fact, 25 to 50% of runners annually will actually sustain an injury um, or have reported injuries in the past. Um, it's really important to, yeah, obviously figure out what's going on there um, because that'll end up potentially, yeah, causing a cessation of training or a reduction of your training volume. Okay, so what happens when we run? Um, probably the first thing to point out um, are when differentiating between walking and running, we've got your two float phases here and here. So your float phases happen when your both feet are up off the ground. This is, yeah, your kind of main thing that's going to differentiate as we go from walking into a faster pace and coming into your running and your jogging. Um, so the three main phases of running that we've got are your absorption or your loading phase. Then you move into your propulsion phase um, following that. Then subsequently you've got your initial swing and your terminal swing. So I'm just grouping swing as one big phase, but yeah, know that there's yeah, those three main phases that are happening with running. The other important thing that you can see in the uh, diagram here is that obviously the running cycle is cyclical. So your previous uh, phase of running is going to have an impact on what's happening in the next phase. So for example, if you're loading phase, so initially when you're actually making contact with the ground, if that's inefficient or there's something going on there, that's going to affect how you then move into your toe off. Um, that's also then going to potentially roll over into issues with your swing phases. So yeah, really important just to understand that each section actually does have a bit of a flow on effect. And that's really going to be uh, helpful at kind of, yeah, just understanding the running cycle a little bit more. The idea is always, obviously, we're just trying to make your running more efficient. So trying not to lose energy uh, through the cycle is going to be yeah, helpful again. 
Uh, okay, so let's look a little bit further down at your loading and your absorption phase. So if we just follow the blue foot here, so your absorption or your phase begins with your foot making contact with the ground. This is a really, really important phase of your running. So often a lot of injuries will happen here. A lot of dysfunction within the running cycle begins here. Uh, that's because your ground reaction forces are really high at this point. So as your foot's making contact with the ground, that's where your body uh, is absorbing force or not absorbing force and can yeah, correlate to some really uh, common running injuries. Obviously, if yeah, forces from the ground are not absorbed properly by the body, there's going to be potential for breakdown. Then you move into your propulsion phase. So uh, here you've got the foot kind of moving, moving from initial contact here to your mid stance and then into your toe off. Uh, the um, prep between kind of mid stance to toe off here is where you've got your peak ground reaction forces happening as well. So yeah, really important to pay a bit of attention to that, um, that part of your running game. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more again about initial contact. So like I said before, obviously the way that we make impact with the ground is gonna have a big effect coming up and down the chain. So with your initial contact, We've got different types of uh, uh, heel strike, um, forefoot strike um, and midfoot strike. So yeah, a few kind of different variations through here. Rear foot strike or heel strike, that's present in roughly about 80% of runners. Um, there's a lot of information kind of emerging, talking um, in a lot of running blogs and a lot of evidence that's starting to say midfoot strike is the most optimal. You'll see midfoot strike happening in pretty proficient runners, so kind of more into your athletes. Forefoot strike, <clears throat> not as common. Um, however, going to be pretty common in your sprinters. So think about Usain Bolt running 100 metres. He's probably never actually going to have heel contact with the ground. He's going to be primarily or only on his toes. Um, so yeah, just helpful to understand there. Like none of these are, oh sorry, um, necessarily uh, an issue. Um, they just might be. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go further through. Um, okay, so here we, just breaking down your mid stance here a little bit further. So looking at the green leg now, your vertical ground reaction forces are here at your maximum. Then when you're moving again into your toe off, so your toe starts to point down to the ground, your hip and your knee are extending, so coming back behind the midline here. Uh, this is really important to then prepare you moving into your swing phase. So your swing phase, also known as your recovery phase, so it's where a lot of runners actually, uh, yeah, kind of get a bit of rest because you're actually using a lot of the absorb absorbed um, elastic rec recoil from your tendons and your muscles to kind of, yeah, float through into your running. Uh, swing phase. Okay, cool. So it's all very technical. I think it's just helpful just to have a little bit of a, a brief understanding of exactly what's happening through the running cycle. This leads us into our common running injuries. So like I said, a lot of runners will experience injury at some point in their running career. Uh, the majority of running injuries that we see are most commonly overuse injuries. So injuries that are sustained over time. Most commonly you'll see injured sites being your knee, your foot, your ankle. Uh, you can also have injuries happening at your lower back, uh, your pelvis, your hip. Um, so yeah, just a few commonly injured sites that we'll see typically here in the clinic. Uh, a lot of these sorts of injuries as well will have really high recurrence rates. So something that I touched on again a little bit earlier important to identify again, what's actually causing these injuries, what's the root cause, you're not trying to apply kind of a band-aid fix to a lot of these types of injuries, you're actually wanting to identify what's going on, why is it happening, so that we can prevent them from reoccurring. So again, multiple factors that might come into play with some of these sorts of injuries, uh, but yeah, lower limb, kinematics, or your running gait, your running cycle, definitely some really clear links in the evidence in terms of um, running, poor running form, potentially causing some of these injuries. So yeah, just to list a few here, for example, patellofemoral pain, so pain around the kneecap, ITB syndrome, uh, or um, so yeah, commonly pain around the outside of your knee, 
um, your shin splints or your medial tibial stress syndrome, Achilles tendinopathies, plantar fasciitis, stress fractures, um, and other various kind of muscle strains. Hopefully some common terms there, um, but hopefully won't become common for you. So understanding injury, um, we actually want to think about what are some of the really early warning signs that you guys might find benefit from tuning into a little bit. So these are just, yeah, a really kind of brief snapshot of some things to kind of help you avoid ending up here. Uh, so your really common <coughs> uh, overuse injuries, uh, they often start quite similarly. So uh, like I said before, again, thinking back to your running gait and your running pattern, um, there might be some sort of biomechanical flaw happening, um, but yeah, they often present quite similarly. Obviously, pain or swelling anywhere generally around the lower limb is probably where you'll commonly see pain or swelling. Not necessary though. Um, definitely a big kind of warning sign if you're getting any of those issues. Pay attention to it. Um, waking up stiff and sore in the morning. So this is a really big thing that'll happen with a lot of running injuries. So first kind of 30 to 60 minutes of the day, starting to kind of just step out of bed, maybe the bottom of your foot or the heel of your foot is a little bit sore, a little bit tender, you're getting a bit of stiffness or some soreness around your Achilles tendons, stuff like that are really uh, important thing to pay attention to because uh, yeah that can obviously be the start of plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendinopathies. Um, unexplained localised tightness um, or unexplained localised pain anywhere, this is um, something that I just want to highlight, it's not DOMS. So DOMS, also your delayed onset muscle soreness, is a normal thing, a normal part of training. DOMS is usually a really good sign to say that your tissues are adapting to loads um, and they're learning to kind of overcome that. However, DOMS should really only be lasting one to two days. So if your DOMS, you go for a big run, you're sore the next day, but you continue to be sore for three or four days afterwards, something then again there to pay attention to. Tendinopathies, so these all commonly present very much um, with pain happening at the start of your run. So some of you might have experienced this, for example, um, starting off a run with a little bit of heel pain, but then you're like, no, actually, I think I can push through this. This is warming up. Uh, and then it goes away and you're like, great, don't need to worry about it. Let's just put that to the back of our mind and not think about it and then it rears its head worse a little bit later on. So potentially later in the run or potentially uh, worse the next day or later that day. Um, that's really something to pay attention to. I uh, mentioned here as well, kind of the onset of pain during a longer run. So for example, if you're like, no, actually my running's really good. However, every time I get to that 5K mark, that's where I'm starting to notice a little bit of hip pain, a little bit of ankle pain, something to pay attention to there. That's a really common sign of an actual biomechanical fault happening. So something's going wrong in your running kinematics potentially. Uh, obviously tenderness to touch anywhere. I mentioned before um, that kind of, I don't know if any of you have had plantar fascia pain in the, in the past, but stepping out of bed in the morning, putting your heel down on the floor first thing and going, ouch, that really hurts. Uh, or uh, yeah, shin splints, kind of pain along the front of the shin, tenderness to touch there, pain at the Achilles. You just kind of spend some time kind of rubbing around your ankles and your feet. You're like, oh, actually that's a little bit sore. A really good warning sign that something's going on. <clears throat> um, and then, yeah, just highlighting again here, any worsening of these types of signs is probably a good indication that you're actually already injured. So trying to identify some of these early warning signs is really helpful at obviously combating injury and hopefully helping you guys prevent, yeah, that reduction or cessation of training that I was talking about before. Okay, so I'm gonna go into some biomechanical faults now. These are something that I want to preface with the fact that um, any, all of these, combination of any of these may not necessarily mean that your running form is bad. It may not necessarily mean that your running form is going to lead to injury. Um, however, the ones that I'm about to talk about are found to be uh, quite commonly um, and proven in the evidence to say that these are all biomechanical flaws that are happening in injured runners. So there's no kind of um, magic recipe like Tim mentioned before about your running. However, um, 
yeah, good just to kind of put a lot of these things into the bigger picture. So yeah, we're really not looking at these things in isolation. However, if you are kind of reporting potentially some signs of injury, this is where looking at your biomechanical faults in your running uh, is really important. So the first one that I'm going to talk about here is your contralateral hip drop. So you can see with the red markers, um, some lines in this lady's pelvis. So we're looking at her from behind. Uh, you can see on the left, obviously the right hip is sitting up a lot higher than the left when she's making impact on the treadmill. Um, so some things that this will cause are your increased tension happening through your IT band uh, and pulling and tracking that patella laterally. So your kneecap actually starting to shift away from the patellofemoral joint, so away from the midline of your knee. The tightness through your ITB there can cause that yeah, patella to come across. Often that'll uh, present itself like your ITB stress syndrome or your patellofemoral pains. A contralateral hip drop, so again looking at this um, uh, hip, hip drop on the runner on the left, you have a shift of your ground reaction forces. So like I was talking about before, when you're making impact with the ground and your hip is uh, having uh, experiencing that sort of dropping you're going to get a lot more loading happening through the shin a lot more loading happening down through the foot and particularly around the achilles so that's something that is proven to be linked to things like shin splints achilles tendinopathies so yeah important to understand that how hip drop is really going to affect particularly that phase of your um, initial uh, stance or initial contact when you're running uh, obviously, contralateral hip drop as well is just going to affect your ability for your trunk to be uh, continuing in an upright position. So what are some things that are going to cause hip drop? Usually, it's your reduced strength at the hip, so particularly glute max, glute med. Uh, these are the pretty most, most common uh, culprits of these sorts of signs. So, and again, your delayed onset of glute med, so outer, outer hip, um, and your glute max, big puppies at the back, is shown in patellofemoral pain, Achilles tendinopathies. Um, so yeah, obviously some weakness or delayed kind of endurance in those muscle tissues are really, really important to address. Um, okay, so moving into an increased amount of knee extension and ankle dorsiflexion on land. So again, injured runners, again, this might be completely normal. Uh, as physios, we assess people in the community a lot. Um, don't know if you're aware of that, hot, hot tip. We're always watching how people move. There's a lady who runs from Bonner Junction here all the way down on concrete, um, all the way down Oxford Street to Centennial Park. And she has a very lopsided running gait. She continues to run every day. She has pretty good pace. However, looking at her, my physio mind jumps to panic. Here's my card, what's going on? However, she continues to run. She seems pretty efficient with her running. Uh, who knows? So yeah, I think it's just making that point to say, again, can't look at these issues in isolation. Some of these things really might be normal for anyone. Um, but yeah, again, some of these things really do correlate in the literature to actual injury and breakdown. So yeah, just going back to your um, increased amount of knee extension. Uh, so this can commonly look like overstriding. So you'll see the foot making impact with the ground further forwards than the pelvis. This can create a lot of issues uh, at the knee. Um, so with the knee extended and the ankle dorsiflexion, you can see this red line here. So the position of how your foot is uh, contacting with the ground, that can provide a, a braking force to your running. So your running efficiency is often gonna slow down. You're losing, again, we're talking about running, we're trying to keep your efficiency high. So having that kind of overstride, having an increased amount of knee extension, so your knee being straighter upon impact and that increase of dorsiflexion, so your foot angle being a lot higher, uh, yeah, has some impact in terms of how you're gonna be able to absorb your ground reaction forces. These sorts of things are shown to be common in um, medial 
uh, tibial stress sy syndrome, so sorry, uh, shin splints. Uh, again, with these sorts of patterns, you're going to end up with some patella tilting and lateral displacement happening around the kneecap again. So there's just a lot more force happening through the knee and you can kind of predict that by looking at the picture um, and having a look at these red markers. Uh, really does show kind of, yeah, just how you might think the body is able to actually absorb the forces through back through the foot, ankle, knee, coming up the chain. Uh, again, so some foot strike patterning might be something at play with runners that show these sorts of running patterns. Uh, your heel foot strikers or your rear foot strikers are coincidentally the only ones that are actually going to show this flaw. So yeah, midfoot or your forefoot runners aren't, this isn't actually going to be an issue for them. So again, just something interesting to think about in terms of your uh, foot strike and your foot patterning. Again, what, what's going to cause this? So potentially some excessive arching through your lower back. So that often happens when runners are trying to kind of reach. Uh, they end up putting too much stress through their lower back. Uh, and again, your weak glutes and your core uh, strength deficits are potentially also going to have an issue with your uh, these sorts of mechanics. Um, okay, moving on to your tibial angle at your foot strike. So your tibia being your shin. So the extended tibia uh, or a tibia kind of much further in front of the center of mass in the body is going to have issues. So particularly issues with um, impact. So if you have a look at image A, you can see this line is not sitting vertical. The points of contact, I don't know if how good your eyes are, but there's some lateral markers on this runner, which are used in video analysis oftentimes to kind of identify your anatomical landmarks. So you can see uh, impacts happening, the ankles in front of the knee. So you can just see how and start to think again how that might actually affect how you're able to absorb forces through the lower limb. Your vertical shin, so B, or your flexed shin are gonna show for yeah, much better and more even distribution of the forces through the lower limb. So again, your body's just gonna be able to make contact with the ground and dissipate those forces much better through your body. Another issue that's really common um, is overstriding. So again, you can see these markers on image B. The, um, the vertical line that we're looking at is Again, we're looking from toes up towards the hip. So from the ankle here, you can see the vertical line sits much further forwards than the pelvis. Whereas in A, you've got a nice kind of stacking here between the ankle and the hip. Uh, that can, you can see again in this image here, that can look like increased uh, ankle dorsiflexion. Um, and again, yeah, you're obviously getting the landing and impact happening much further forwards from the body's center of mass. So yeah, again, another common issue that we do see with a lot of running floors. One of the final ones that I'm gonna mention is forwards trunk lean or particularly excessive forwards trunk lean. So generally we want a reasonably upright posture when we run. So you can see that demonstrated in um, the lady in figure A. So there's actually a, a small amount of um, uh, or forwards lean happening. So roughly about five to 10 degrees is acceptable. However, in your figure B, you can see this gentleman, his head is much further forwards, his shoulders are much further forwards. That's going to, yeah, affect potentially his running efficiency um, and potentially lead to injury. Uh, commonly, your forwards trunk leaning will happen um, due to an inability to control that kind of upright trunk position. So often looking at weakness in the paraspinals, weakness around your core or weakness around your glutes. Kill. So they're just some of the common biomechanical flaws that we do see with runners um, that are injured. Um, again, take them all with a grain of salt. We've got to look at the big picture here. Now it's kind of time to go through how we'd actually do an analysis and what we're looking for in terms of the bigger picture and then trying to piece those little pieces of the puzzle together because as Claire kind of said, normally with injuries they don't sort of occur in isolation. You're not just going to have one problem with your knee that gives you pain. It's looking through the whole chain that gives us a little bit more information about where we need to address to keep these injuries from happening. 
Um, so the way we do this is through our running assessment. So specifically today, we're going to talk a little bit more about our treadmill approach and what we're in particular looking for on the treadmill. Um, but before that, it's obviously important to get a bit more of a history about what's going on with our injured runners. We're not just going to get someone in here and then chuck them straight on the treadmill and get them to just run at a random pace because odds are that's not actually going to reproduce their symptoms um, and it's probably not going to be too helpful for us. So in our running assessment, we start with a subjective. The subjective is going to give us lots of information about the injury history, looking at whether there is a previous history of a similar sort of pain or swelling or any of those kind of symptoms that Claire was talking about and whether this has been kind of reoccurring over time. Um, load is really important for runners as well. Lots of people, especially in lockdown, decided that they might want to become a runner because all the gyms closed and we got lots and lots of running injuries as a result because you can't really just go out and not have done a run for 10 years and then decide we're going to run three times a week and we're going to run 20 k's. Because you will end up here and that's not where you want to be. Um, it also gives us some good information about footwear as well. Um, same sort of problem in lockdown. People decided that their runners from two years ago probably have really good shock absorption still. They don't. Um, and that contributes to your injuries as well. Um, and then we like to check in, lots of people these days have their fitness devices as well. So we're not just going to pop you up on the treadmill and run at a pace that might be good for me because that's not reproducing what you might be doing around Centennial Park on the weekends. So we want to be able to reproduce with our treadmill assessment the pace that people are running at. Um, we want to also be able to reproduce their cadence as well. So cadence is how many steps they're taking per minute. And then we also want to be making sure with our treadmill analysis too that if you get symptoms coming up at maybe like the 5k mark, that is different to if we were only going to get you to start running <coughs> one kilometre. You're probably not going to get symptoms in our assessment. And odds are the things that start to happen in your gait at the 5k mark are a little bit different to what's happening around the one kilometre mark. Um, so that's why the subjective is quite important. And then we go into our video analysis. So with our video analysis on the treadmill, we definitely mm -hmm. need at least two views. Often we'll do three. Two being definitely one from the side view to give us a side profile. And then the second one being either from the front or the back. Um, and usually we'll probably do both just to confirm kind of what we're seeing through the back view. Um, and then once we kind of have a better idea of what's going on through the video assessment, we can slow it down frame by frame. What we're looking at then is whether we can confirm or disprove some of our hypotheses about where, why these things are happening. So Claire was kind of touching on things like when you're getting a bit of pelvic drop and that type of thing. That stuff can be caused by glutes, but it could also be caused by other issues through the chain. So we want to make sure that we're not just trying to pigeonhole someone and you've definitely got really weak glutes that are causing this. We want to make sure we're actually finding the cause so that in future this is definitely not going to keep on happening. Um, and then sometimes if indicated, we might end up doing more of a force plate analysis and that just refers to um, a little plate that we use sometimes if we're worried about um, a person's foot posture and whether we think that's also contributing to their gait, um, we can have a closer look about where they're really producing most of the force in their walking. It's a little bit harder with the running, um, but it shows us some general trends about where the person is likely to wait there and if we need to make some corrections with some orthotics. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to dive into how we actually break down a running assessment. So firstly, like I was saying, we're talking about two different views. We're going to go through the side view first and what we're looking for in particular from a bottoms up approach. So we're going nose all the way up to toes. And then we're going to have a look as well, looking at what's happening from the behind. So if we're looking at our image here, we're going to flick to some videos and a case study in a second to actually see what happens. But just the general things that kind of Claire has already touched on a little bit. We're looking at foot strike pattern. So what she was talking about in terms of just identifying to start with, whether this person is a heel striker, whether they are a midfoot striker or whether they are a toe runner as well. And 
on what Claire was saying about different um, speeds of running, you're saying Bolt's going to run on his toes. So it's important that we, run, we know what speed you're actually running at because if you're running at maybe 6 minute 30 kilometres, then odds are that you're probably not actually going to be generating enough speed to actually get on your toes. So it's important to know these things in the subjective. Um, foot inclination angle we've also touched on briefly. So that's just referring to how the angle is sitting. So the belt of the treadmill and then the sole of the foot, which in this picture is quite flat. We're then looking at the tibial angle. Not very good with this pointer. Um, the tibial angle at loading response. So we're looking tibia is your shin bone. So right from the middle of the knee down to the midpoint of the ankle. We are then looking at your knee flexion during stance phase. So what we ultimately want to see during the stance phase is we want to see that your knee can absorb the load. So when you strike your heel, there needs to be a change in your angle from heel strike until in the middle of the gait cycle where your knee should actually bend and that's showing capacity that your quads and your knee can actually absorb the force through your gait cycle and it's not instead being dissipated somewhere else. Um, we then move up to your hip, so we're looking at essentially the back leg at toe off. So right before we're coming into toe off stage, we want to see what angle your hip is going at and that will change at different speeds as well. Um, and that's that whole elastic recoil. If you're running at faster speeds, we generally do expect a bit more of a hip extension angle too. Then we've got trunk lean, um, so just referring to the position of the the upper body in relation to the hips and the pelvis. Um, we've spoken a little bit about overstriding in previous strides as well, so we won't touch on that too much more. And then we're going to talk about the vertical displacement as well. So those kind of really bouncy runners that you might see, that their energy is actually just going up instead of forwards. So in relation to that, what we're looking for is we're taking a position around the pelvis and we're measuring what the lowest point is in that pelvis compared to how high they are during their float stage to see if they're kind of actually just going up and down too much as opposed to if we can direct their energy a little bit more concentrated um, in a forward way. So that's what we're looking for in terms of the side view. Um, and then we're going to head to the rear view. So rear view equally is important. We kind of want to piece all of these puzzles together. From a nose to toes, actually we're going to do toes to nose. So toes to nose approach again, starting at the bottom, we're looking at the base of support. So ideally we don't want any leg crossing. Some people you will see, you can kind of visualise them from the side and they look like a perfect runner, which you're kind of going to see in a couple of next sides. But when you actually look at from them from the back, they're starting to cross over their legs, which is not ideal. Um, so we kind of want our feet landing underneath our hips when we're running, generally speaking. Um, heel invert eversion, that kind of refers more to, people have probably heard multiple times, people talking about flat foot sort of positioning, and that's kind of more of a technical term for it. We're looking at the angle from, say, that top of the shoe there to the bottom of the shoe, and whether that's a nice vertical, showing our heel is quite nice and upright, or whether for someone who's a little bit more flat-footed, it'll be rolling in upon contact. Um, we also have the foot progression angle, so whether we kind of run with our heel and toe facing forward, or whether we might have a heel, toe in, toe out sort of position. Heel whipping, which will be a little bit more um, evident in the videos coming, we'll jump back to that. Knee window, pretty self-explanatory. What we want to see is a small gap between the knees as we kind of move through our gait cycle. Um, there should be a small gap. We don't want to see anyone who has no gap, which you can see only in this rear view mirror. Mirror. Um, and then we've got pelvic drop as well, which Claire's touched on a little bit, and you can see in this image here, it's another example of pelvic drop. So the final view, which we will sometimes use, is our front view. Um, and that's just kind of going to confirm or disprove some of the things we're thinking about as well in terms of what could be possibly going on. One of those things is our knee angle and looking at whether our knee is sitting underneath our hip during the mid stance phase or whether we're getting a little bit of rolling in of our knee um, and then just confirming our base of support as well. 
So the following slides are going to be a bit of an example of how we will do that with a real person and we will not ask everyone to take their shirts off. You can do it with it on but this just gives us a bit more um, clarity about what's going on at different landmarks. Um, so we're going to start the video in a second. Basically what I want you to have a look at in the video is kind of starting your approach from the nose toes to nose, bottoms up sort of approach. Start looking at the heel strike, start looking at what's happening at the knee, start looking at what's happening at the hip. We've obviously got a couple of um, green ticks here. So from the side on Liam here, he looks like he's a pretty okay runner. It's gonna slow down in a little second and we can see that he is in fact a nice midfoot sort of striker. He's definitely not a heel striker, he's more of a midfoot striker. His foot's nice and flat with contact. This image also shows that he's also got quite an ideal tibia angle. So the shin angle is really nice and vertical if we're looking from his knee down to his ankle. We move up towards the knee and what we're looking at on this left side of the knee as it comes through is what happens to his knee angle. So from here we want to see a definite change in this knee to show that he's actually absorbing force as it keeps on moving through, which is good. So big ticks, big green ticks from all around there. And then we're moving up and we're looking at his hip extension. So as it circles back around, we'll watch the real time again. And then as it circles back around, you'll see that on that left side and the right side, he's got pretty good hip extension happening. He's got nice hip extension. It's going to be propelling him forward. What you can also see in this view as we track up a little bit further though is that he has a little bit of extra trunk lean. So his chest position is a little bit further forward than we kind of would want. He's not exactly upright. So that's one thing if we're being quite picky. And we are going to be picky about it because as we flick to the next stage, he kind of looks like in, in this video, in this side video, that he's pretty efficient at running and he kind of looks like he'd have no problems. But as we flick to the next sort of slide, we are going to find a couple of different issues. Is that the video again? Yeah. There we go. Okay, so looking at the rear view mirror, rear view video, um, he has a lot more red marks coming through than he does green. So for Liam, Liam is an example of someone who decided during lockdown to start running a few k's a week against the advice of his physiotherapist. <laughs> um, Liam started running, so he's, he has been a runner most of his life, but when he stopped running and started again, he just thought that he could continue running at the same volume as he was as about an 18 year old. Um, so he was running in a fairly short time, he was running about 60 k's a week, which is a lot. He didn't have new shoes, he didn't have anything like that. And he started to get a couple of different symptoms. So one of them interestingly was some back pain that he suffers from occasionally. Um, the other interesting thing for him was that he was found to have really, really tight pelvic floor, so an overactive pelvic floor, so problems with his core. If we continue to have a look at the video here, we're going to see a couple of reasons why he was starting to get those symptoms. So same sort of approach again, we're looking at the bottoms up approach. So bottoms up, first up we're looking at his base of support. Straight away what we can see with his left side and his right side, they're both doing it, but more so on his left side he's actually got a bit of a scissoring gait. So he's not fantastic at actually landing his feet underneath his hips, which is a bit more pronounced on the right side. And when we flick to the front view as well, it will be a little bit more pronounced again. Liam is definitely an example as well of that heel E version. It's not as obvious on that point, but you can kind of see as the flat frame moves through, as he starts to absorb the force, he gets a little bit of an inward sort of rotation at the heel. He has a heel whip on the left side, not on the right side. So we're starting to see a bit of asymmetry between the left side and the right side. Then we move up a little bit further and we're heading up to the pelvis. What we can see through the pelvis is that he has a definite pelvic drop 
on both sides. So if we look at his bony landmark, so we're looking at the two kind of dimply areas that you can sometimes see in, in people without their shirts on. And you can also see it with the line of his shorts that you've definitely got, you haven't got a horizontal line, you've got a bit of a curve. So he's not really controlling that side to side movement through his glutes at all. Then we look up a little bit higher. We're looking, we didn't mention this before, but it's of particular importance for someone like Liam. He has a crazy amount of rotation going on through his lower back. Coincidentally, yes, he has back pain, but you can see how much he's actually moving through his lower back. And then if we scan up a little bit higher, what we actually notice is more asymmetry between the left side and the right side in terms of his shoulders. So this is kind of important that we actually took his shirt off to see what's happening up a little bit higher because it helps us to realise what the probable cause in cause is. And it turns out Liam's, you can see how kind of jacked up his, his trap is up through the neck on the left side. His left shoulder is barely moving, barely going through that arm swing, whereas his right side is. He's not getting enough drive through his arms. He's not getting the symmetry through his arms. And so what he's doing down through here is he's compensating a whole heap through his lower back to try and generate a little bit more force. And in turn, that's affecting his hips and then it's affecting his foot landing as well. So with Liam, if we kept his shirt on, we might have just gone, oh yeah, he's got some pelvic drop and he's scissoring his gait and let's have a look at his glutes. We wouldn't have actually found what's going on up a little bit higher and the fact that, hey, he's actually got an old shoulder injury that's currently still affecting his gait. He's got weak core and his pelvic floor is overactive and not actually being very helpful. And it's just making his whole gait cycle fairly inefficient essentially. Um, any questions about this so far? It's all okay. So if we then flick a little bit further across, we are just basically confirming in this image as to whether the cause of his kind of scissoring gait is coming because his knees are collapsing inwards or if it is because his hip movement isn't fantastic. And what you can see through this image is that his knees aren't rotating inwards quite obviously. It's actually just coming from the fact that his hips, are legs, his hips are causing that crossover through the midline and it just confirms his problems with his base of support. What I'm going to talk about is sort of good running form that we want to get people hopefully getting to. Obviously with good running form it doesn't necessarily mean that you know it needs to be the most perfect running form. We're just trying to give you some examples of what you should be aiming for as a runner to try and be on the other side of injury prevention when you're running. It doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get injured but it's more likely that you will stay less injured if you adopt a better running form. And this running form is based on evidence but also there's a lot of coaches and a lot of non-paired review stuff out there that is in giving you a lot of advice based on runners who are very efficient and don't get injured and then obviously the evidence is following that and hopefully we'll get a lot more evidence over time to back up um, these good running forms. I'll also go through some strength and mobility exercises that you know, are great for runners to do. Not necessarily that uh, you must do all of these. They're the ones that we give runners. There'll be other ones that are very, very specific if they've got actual injuries. So the ones you see today are not necessarily ones for specific injuries. They're just generally good in nature that you may look at adopting to try and improve strength and mobility issues that you may have. So let's look at running form um, and we'll break this down. What we're trying to aim for is an upright type posture. It doesn't mean, like the girl said, absolutely vertical, okay? It is dependent on usually how fast you are running. So if someone is running very slow, we don't want them being forward. That's gonna be very efficient. So they need to maybe be a little bit more upright if they're running so. The faster you run, um, you'll probably find that there will be a forward lean with that based on their gait and how long their stride is and how high their knee is comes. So some people like here, Olympic athletes will be completely upright. You may see other Olympic athletes that are actually forward. And like I said, it's a varying angle. It doesn't necessarily mean you, you know, an Olympic athlete that is running forward like that is wrong. 
Um, we're just wanting to make sure that you know you are trying to maintain an upright as you can, so you're not well forward. Because let's face it, when I say upright for you, you'll probably still be a little bit forward because you are travelling forward. Um, so five to ten degrees is about the ideal. Um, you just got to think tall when you're trying to run. Um, you also might want to look at if you're getting um, or you're looking at or you're getting running injuries or you're uh, overstriding. You want to try and shorten that stride length up a little bit. There's a lot of people out there at the moment that are saying that an increased cadence and a shorter stride leads to more efficiency when they run. Now, if the body's a little bit more efficient, you're less likely to probably compensate and break down, so that makes sense. Um, but the shorter stride length, there's no sort of like absolutes of how long you need to be, depending on how tall you are. Many people, like Usain Bolt, has an extremely long stride, and that's maybe why he's winning. So, you know, there are pros and cons for it. Um, what you can do, and what I've, when I went running the other day, is there was someone ran past me with this tick, 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 and of course they ran past me because they were way faster and they were increasing their cadence and they had a shorter stride length and they were much better. And I was wondering, what is that? And it was a metronome app. Okay, so it was coming from, I don't know whether it was coming from his iPhone, I think it was coming from iPhone or his phone, and it was loud and it was giving him that absolute pace that he needs to be hitting. So he was obviously setting that to a certain stride length and a certain pace that he was trying to achieve to get that efficiency. Um, whether he was running efficient or not, I wasn't watching, but I was just hearing this tick, tick, tick. So some people use that to try and improve what they're doing with their stride length. Um, obviously, with a shorter stride length, you're going to more likely land a midfoot. So people who are trying to adopt a midfoot strike rather than a heel strike because they may be getting some loading problems from heel strike and they're trying to adopt this midfoot strike, they will usually have to shorten their stride length and increase their cadence to get that foot beneath the body. Okay, so is midfoot strike ideal? The jury's still out on that one. Okay, obviously there's literature coming through that is helping us with that. If you look at marathon runners who win Olympics, they are obviously not landing really on their heel and doing lots of braking response. Okay, part of that is because they will get more, those people doing that many kilometers will get more loading response and they probably um, more likely get more injured at that point. But the speed that they are running will make them probably more midfoot. Okay, they are not sprinting like a 100 meter runner who will always be on their toes, but they are certainly not running like you and me at five to six minute K pace. Okay, these guys are doing 42 Ks in two hours, that's 21 Ks an hour. Now, when's the last time you ran 21 Ks an hour on a treadmill? And they're doing it for two hours, right? So it's extremely fast. And if you matched up with one of these people and tried to run, you probably, they would, their pace would be faster than your sprint pace, right? So the midfoot for them, yes, it's ideal for efficiency because they've got to do a marathon. We've got to wait for a little bit more literature on is that the most proficient for injury prevention? Okay, and a lot of the emerging stuff is saying that it is. Um, and hopefully down the track we'll get some more information about that. So when we talk about midfoot strike, it is the foot landing beneath the body. So you've got to think that point there, okay? Not midfoot here, okay? You won't be able to reach out and land midfoot. You're going to be landing heel. So midfoot is actually landing beneath the body. And you saw that on Liam when his foot came down, it was beneath him, okay? The left one was a little bit forward than the right, but he, that's because he had left side versus right side problems, right? Um, and so, like I said, it's more important at the faster paces, and if you, uh, if you go to a four foot strike though, so meaning on your toes, that is more likely to have more Achilles, more calf flow. It doesn't mean you're gonna get injured, but it will mean more calf flow at that point. But of course, when people are running four foot, they're usually running shorter distances, so there's not as much time for that load to build up. It only may become a problem if someone is doing long distance running, running on forefoot. And there's, you know, like the person who's running down Centennial Park, I watch them and they're running on their toes. Okay, well one side is and one side isn't, it's a little bit odd. Um, but also, you know, there's been marathon runners who have won marathons running on their toes. Okay, and that may be because they've done that their entire life and they're conditioned to that. So it's not necessary, just because someone's winning a race doing that, it means the whole population can do that. It needs to come from a bit more research about is that ideal or not. But from a biomechanical point of view, the midfoot looks to be the better option than a heel strike 
or a four foot strike. Um, because that rear foot has got the potential for impact stress. So, when you're running, what you've got to try and think about is also the use of active arms. Sometimes we've got to take a little bit of a leaf out of the people who do it the best, okay? Go, what do they do? Clearly that's not too bad, even if the research doesn't say too much about whether your arm efficiency is good or not, clearly it works for them. But obviously you don't want to be doing this when you are jogging. You don't need to be doing this when you're jogging. It needs to be a dial down effect. So it's all relative to how fast you are running, okay? Obviously when people are shuffling, they've got no use of their arms and obviously the speed comes up, they've got to do a little bit more. You've just got to try and think about being active with your arms is going to help you with injury prevention. Now the reason for that is it uses what we call cross slings and spinal stability. So when in this a lot of this, there's some information out there about this came from Caesar, but we'll talk about that later. From when you run, if I use my left arm to pull down, I'm using my lat, okay, at the back here. So I'm using this muscle here. That's connected through my lumbar fascia, through my back, and it's connected to my glute. So when I push off with my right side, I'm pulling with my left. So those two muscles at the back connect together. Now that's going to give me a, like a band sling at the back of my back, which is going to help me with stability. Okay, So it's like a big, so almost like a rod that way. And then when I do it the other way, it's a rod that way. So they're like a diagonal sling. It's like someone taping you up at the back when you're running. Okay, Now the more efficient you are with that, Okay, so if I'm pushing off my glute, my glute's working, okay, and it's strong, and I'm pulling through, I'm going to be more stable in my back. Now if we look at Liam in that video with Elise, he wasn't very efficient with his left arm, wasn't moving very well, right? And so he was then getting back pain on that left hand side, it was rotating quite a bit. He didn't have that nice cross-sling stability. He was having problems with his core, forward trunk lean, his hips were all over the shop, so he was just lacking all this control. And sometimes it can come down, you can do all the core work on the sun, but if you don't address, say, his shoulder and how it moves, He's never going to have that power to come through from that left-hand side. So that's the stuff you've got to start thinking about, not just how do I work, run with my legs, what are you doing with the upper body? And then also, when I am swinging my arms, am I rotating too much? Okay, so when I, yes. am I running? And, you, and this is, you're going to come away from tonight and going, looking at people when you run, and go, oh my God, look at that person, they're swinging, they're swinging their trunks too much. And so hopefully it'll help you trying to be a little more stable. Again, this trunk swinging is probably indication that you're not, controlled enough through here, okay? You're not strong or neuromuscularly controlled through your section to keep it rock solid. And again, you know, the literature says, yes, you need to probably avoid trunk rotation, but if you look at an Olympic runner, especially with a 100 meter runner, and they have those beautiful cameras that can slow things down, you'll see that this section, if you watch him in slow-mo, his arms and legs are going massive ranges, right? And his abdominals and trunk and head is just a rock solid pillar. They just don't move up, down, forward, back, left, right. It is stable as. And that's learned over time, neuromuscular strength, okay, lots of core training, lots of weights, things like that. But they're training themselves when they run to maintain an upright posture, to reduce trunk rotation, to be more active in the arms. So all the force comes from here and legs, not rotating through their body because the force generated by big muscles here and big muscles here is huge on the spine. You know, if I pull, if I'm not strong enough, it's just going to wrench my spine around. So as strong as you are in the arms, you need to be equally as strong in your trunk and in your lower back. All right? So what we work on is for people with, who are struggling with trunk rotation is core stability training and these anti-rotation exercises, which I'll show you in a moment. So last one, in the hips. Again, we touched on this about what position ideally you want to hips want to be in. So these are the things that this is going to get hard. You can't just go for a run and think about, oh, I must maintain my hip up and try and keep my hip up. This comes from, you know, this is what we need to aim for. You can't go out and just think about this and do it. Okay, you need to be doing strengthening work if you've got problems with it. And over time, that will become a more natural movement and you won't have to think about it it's like an automatic function okay because i'm pretty sure usain bolt does not have to think about his hips when he's running 100 meters in 9.6 seconds right so we also got to think about increased hip flexion so are you running with minimal knee up 
and obviously the faster you go, the more the knee is going to come up. So if you're sprinting, it's going to be here. If you're jogging, it's probably going to be here. Now, a lot of people, it's probably not high enough. They're probably not getting their knee up enough. Maybe they're lacking a little bit of strength here, okay? And so they're not getting up here. Therefore, to get their foot on the ground, they extend their leg. So we need to be getting them up so when they come down, it's beneath their foot. And a lot of sprinters and athletes who are doing athletics and running events are doing a lot of these drills where they, they will do A skips and things like this to try and get, teach their brain to lift their knee and put it down underneath their foot. It's part of their warm-up drills. Um, we also need to make sure that they're getting adequate hip extension. So are they, whoopsie, are they getting enough movement that way? Okay, so are they pushing through well enough? And is, is it a is it a, simply because they're too tight here, they're too weak here, or is it because they're too weak in the glute or the hamstring? Okay, and these are the sort of things we're going to need to test in the clinic to see which part of that component is causing you a lack of hip extension, give you exercises to work on that. Um, and obviously we want that small gap between knees. You can't think about that again. You can't sort of think about how do I run with my knees apart. It is probably a biomechanical strength issue that we need to start focusing on. So... When we come to exercises, I've broken this down into sort of mobility exercises and strengthening exercises or stability exercises. And you'll notice a little theme going through this a moment, which I'll touch on in a moment of what seems to be more and what seems to be less. What we want to make sure of is you're working on calf and ankle mobility. Remember, this is the sort of stuff you're landing on that heel. We want to make sure you've got enough knee uh, sorry, enough ankle range in here. And some people that have, say, had previous ankle sprains or ankle problems or even surgery, things like that, have lost some of that dorsiflexion. And when they come back to running, they need to start working on it. So the two things that ideally, if you want to do the most important two things, is stretching out your long calf, your gastroc, and working on dorsiflexion of your ankle. So that one can be easily done off a step. If you're out, you know, you're going for a run, it could be off a gutter, it could be off a step at home, that sort of thing. You want to be looking at, you know, stretches that are up to one minute, maybe even two minutes, to try and generate some sort of creep through the tissues over time, and getting that off a step to get the length through there. Okay, it's very important that you have enough adequate muscle length in that muscle tissue. More importantly here though, is probably the range in your ankle. So this one is a really nice drill, um, if you're just warming up, to try and work on trying to get as far forward as you can in the ankle and pushing it forward like that. And these, all these drills have got to be done, you know, easily. Like, can you do it at home? Can you do it out in the park before you go for the run? So it's achievable. You don't have to go to the gym every time you want to go for a run. So all these things we're trying to get people doing at home or in the park or wherever they're going running beforehand at least, maybe even the day before, so when they go into that run, they're a bit looser and they can work on left versus right. Um, then obviously hip and thigh mobility. The sort of world's greatest stretch, this one here, is gonna tackle a lot of things for a runner around their hips. So with this stretch here, you're gonna tackle some hip flexors, you're gonna tackle some groin, you're also gonna tackle some hamstrings, and you're going to tackle the actual hip joint range. So this one, you know, not that you do one exercise the rest of your life, but if you're going to choose one and you had only five minutes to do an extra stretch before you went out for a run, this is probably going to be the number one I would go for. I want you to do all of them <laughs> if you can, but this one here is super important. Um, with this one, and you'll notice when you do this yourself, when you go into this position here, you're aiming for trying to weight bear through your hands and relax your tissues. Now, that's, for some people, they'll get to here and they go, oh, I can't go any further, all right? But as you get better at this, you'll learn how to relax in this position. With this, you're going to get, obviously, the groin on adductors on this side. If you go further, you're going to get a little bit of hamstring. You're going to get a lot of hip flexion range in the joint here and hip flexor range here, okay? So there's a lot of stuff going on. And it'll feel like you're sort of getting split in half a little bit. But if you look at that position, I'm in my running phase. Okay, so I need this range. This is my swing phase. When I push off and go through, it's exactly the same position. So it makes sense to get stuck into this sort of position here to help you with adequate hip extension, to help you with you know, hip flexion range movement so you can actually get your knee up, okay? especially if you're doing sprinting. And again, look at the dorsiflexion here. So you're actually working on this exercise in here as well. And if you've got tight hip flexors, it addresses that. So it's a fantastic one for runners, this one. Moving on to glutes and 
external range here. We want to make sure that not just your glutes are stretched out, okay, and not too tight. A lot of people are sitting down too much these days. They don't have enough range to external rotation. This is a really nice one to do on your sofa, okay, on a couch, on a sofa, on a bed, something like that. Not the full pigeon where, you know, many people cannot get into this sort of position and go, hey, this is great, you know, into this thing. That, that's too hard for them. So if you're starting off, up a bit higher is going to be a lot more achievable for you. And doing it this way, rather than doing glutes like this and doing this sort of thing and just stretching your glute, this way you're actually getting external hip joint range. So that movement there, which you need to generate torque in this muscle here. If you don't have enough range that way, you'll find it hard to get enough glute power and strength when you're doing your strength exercises for your glutes to help your hip control, okay? And the last one is obviously quads. Now this one here, you're also gonna get a little bit of hip flexor as well. The quads one, it's a great one to do. Put maybe a pillow under your knee with this one to help settle it down. If you're in grass, it's a lot easier. This one can be done anywhere. You can put your foot up on a bench, you can put it on the edge of the sofa. It's a great one to do while you're watching TV. Um, and this will work on your quadriceps mobility here. A lot of runners get tight in their quads, and especially if they're doing a lot of hills, they're gonna get very stiff in there. This is a great way to loosen up. It also helps tackle some of the patellofemoral things that are going on in the knee. If they're getting tightness around the knee, maybe due to their biomechanics, because let's face it, some of these people that are you know, getting problems from maybe like Liam who's scissoring over, has to work on his hip strength, but he might also be tight in there because he's doing that. So to help him with the symptoms, he might be doing some stretching here, which is technically a bit of a band-aid, but it does help him get a bit looser, a bit less painful, so he can carry on and keep doing the strengthening work. But a lot of these things are, these mobility exercises are designed to help you increase your range, to help you be more efficient, right? And then do your strengthening work, not just for pain relief. So don't sort of think, oh, I'll just do some stretches and then I'll be a bit looser and less painful and then that will fix me. Most likely you're getting tight because of some strength issues, the biomechanical issues, okay? So you're doing the exercises here and the stretching range to try and sort of get you to the point where you're doing some strengthening work, give you some pain relief, fix a few of the biomechanical tightness areas um, to move on to the next section. Now, last two are lumbar and thoracic. So two other essentials, and you notice there's not a massive focus on lumbar spine and thoracic spine mobility. It's more about the strength and you'll come to see in the second section. But if people are lacking lumbar spine extension, we get them doing some McKenzie work here to try and improve their flexibility here. Especially if people are sitting down all day, they've got a history of back problems like maybe disc pressure issues or disc bulges, and they're usually just sitting down all day and then go straight out the door for a run. This is the sort of thing we wanna make sure they are doing before they load their back up. Um, other people may have problems where they stand all day or they're very tight in their muscles in their lower back. And some people who have a weak core and they run maybe with a forward trunk lean and a little bit of an anterior pelvic tilt and a little bit of laxity here because they don't have enough strength here, will find that their lower back is doing all the work and gets very tight when they're running. And that's one of you people that maybe if you stand all day or if you you know, go shopping for a bit or you, you're going around looking at museums and your back is wrecking, it's an indication that you're A, too tight and B, too weak. This is a really good mobility stretch to do to try and improve that. It's a little bit technical, so we always have videos on, on our social media on this exercise to try and work on that. But again, it's a little bit like a, you need to be doing this to get looser, to work on then your core, okay, or your strengthening work to try and fix the problem in the first place. Uh, and thoracic mobility, that's a beautiful one for rotation, okay, to try and get thoracic, a little bit of rotation in the lumbar spine, but mostly thoracic spine. And then this one here, which is opening up through your chest. So we're looking at trying to get tissues in the front. If you're one of those sedentary people who's in this position all day, slumped over a computer, we want to be able to open up because if you're like this all day, you're probably gonna be running like this, okay? We wanna be having that upright posture and get your you know, arms swinging properly. So you need a little bit of mobility through the front. This will be the one you go for. So you'll notice between sort of here and here, we don't even go you too many stretches, right? When it comes to strengthening, we need you doing a whole lot more. The focus is 
a lot of the time when you were doing dealing with people with run, who are runners and trying to work on their injury prevention or fixing things that are going wrong, it is the strengthening side of things and the spinal stability and the hip stability over the mobility. A lot of people go for the mobility because it's sort of easy to do and it really tackles the pain and it quickly solves things, but that's all it does, quickly solves things, okay? We use that to get to this stuff, okay? Because this is more the permanent fix. This is gonna fix the strength issues that are going on and why they're getting the injuries in the first place. So, not that you do one exercise, if you know, some people say, oh, you've got nine there, can I just have one? You could, but it depends on the person, okay? The number one spinal stability one we give is obviously a bird dog, okay? You might not have seen this one, some people have done this before. This is gonna work on your cross slings, okay? So when you're a runner, it's gonna work on your stability at the back, all right? Obviously, it's not as much abdominal strengthening here, so if you've got someone who's got a massive abdominal strengthening weakness, you wouldn't choose this as much. You might be going for something like this or going into something like planks. It depends on the problem. Have they got a spinal stability issue where they need to work on cross slings, or is it just generally they've just got an anterior tilt, they're super stable, they don't move, they're just in this position all the time, they've got really weak abdominals. Maybe it's this one, okay? These are the sort of things that we as practitioners will identify, okay, which exercise you need to do for what problem you've got. Because you could do all of these, okay, but your problem might only be with one or two of them, all right? And saying that, all these are great. So if you, know, if you want to do all of them, be my guest because they'll make you a more efficient runner. Um, the dead bug is like the bird dog, just flip the other way. Again, with these ones, like with little tips on things like bird dog, you want to be sort of either guided by this or watching some of the videos to make sure you're doing it correctly because it is not a thing where you just do this sort of movement like this and try and balance, okay? It is a movement where you're trying to not move. So some of these we talk about anti-rotation or anti-movement. For this sort of thing, I am trying to not move my core when I move my arm and the leg. You think about, if, if you can visualize Usain Bolt when you're doing a bird dog, think about when you break him down, he does not move in his trunk or his head. Okay, so when he moves his arms and legs, he's not going to be wobbling all over the shop. So your job is, with these exercises, is to not wobble. Okay, it's to try and be as stable as possible. Now sometimes people have problems with it and they need to work on their abdominal strength first. They might have to work on other things and different exercises from this that really break it down. So if we give someone an exercise like this and they're having real problems with it, we need to maybe pull it out and go, we need to give you something that's a little bit easier and not so difficult. So you can actually get that movement right. Maybe it's their doming in their core and they need to work on their pelvic floor a little bit more, their transverse abdominus is a bit weak, and so they don't compensate when they do these exercises. This one here is a pal-off press. So again, anti-rotation. This is where you are kneeling, make sure I'm in the right position, with a band going perpendicular to the body. So the band is trying to pull me here. Now we talked about trunk rotation, trying to be strong in my trunk and stop it, you know, rotating as much. So this is an anti-rotation exercise. It's teaching the body to be still. When there's an external force pulling me one way, I'm trying to resist that, okay? So as your, your hands come in with the band, it's easy, and as you push out, it gets harder and harder and harder because the lever's longer, because that lever is trying to pull me that way. So I'll be working on muscles on one side more than the other to keep me stable, to stop me rotating. So when I go for my run, I'm not gonna swing around as much, okay? I'm gonna be more stable through there. So these sort of top three are awesome anti-rotation type oblique slings exercises. The endurance one comes in with the front plank and your side plank, okay? So the front plank is working on more anterior musculature through your abdominals to help you with maybe some pelvic tilt, that sort of thing, and endurance when you're running. The side plank one is gonna work a little more, obviously, on the side, but it works on obliques and what your, your muscle in the back called your QL, which is a massive stabilizer through your lumbar spine. So someone like Liam, we'll be doing a lot of this stuff here and a lot of this stuff here. We'll be instantly going for these two with him. But when we get him doing them, if he can't do them, we're gonna to have to break them down. We've got a whole lot of other exercises in our library that we can break them down. Okay, you need to be doing level one, not level three of this to get him up to speed. And then he returns to something like this to make sure we focus on the most important things for his running. 
Um, then you move to things like clamps. Okay, you've probably done clamps before. This is to get your external rotation power through your hip, which helps you with your hip stability. Along with all these clams and, and exercises, a lot of it is about telling your brain what to do. You see people just doing these like this, and they're probably not doing much because I can do hip abduction with my bum not doing anything. Okay, so you may find, you don't just copy a movement, you've got to make sure you're doing the movement correctly. And so with these sort of things, we instruct people to go, okay, You've got to push through your heels, you've got to have your abdominal switched on, you want to not move at your pelvis, and then you squeeze your buttocks to bring it up, and then it's on. Okay, and a lot of that stuff is brain to muscle work, and it is frustrating, and some of these things that, you know, they're really boring to do, and these exercises, you know, are not very compliant for some people, but once you get them going and you see the results of those sort of exercises and you get the hip stability and then you stop getting pain as much, then they're more likely to be done more often. Um, moving on from your hip external rotation is your hip abduction. So this is one of our favorites in the clinic that we give clients. This one is working on our glute med in a running stance. So it's very specific for people who are playing sport, running, weight bearing, that sort of thing, who need hip stability or hip control, namely weakness in their glute med. So with this movement here, if they have got a ball or anything against the wall, it doesn't have to be a Swiss ball. We like using a Swiss ball because it's you know, really spongy, really sort of push against stuff. This movement here, if I'm pushing my knee into something like that, my opposite side is then counteracting that. So if I sit in a running gait, okay, with my knee bent, hip over my foot, okay, so not my foot forward, so my foot directly beneath my hip, a little bit of bend in the knee, tibia angle forward, sitting in my hip here, and then pushing outwards that way, that lights me up in my glute med here, and a little bit of my glute max and external rotation. And so we'd start people off on isometric, can you at least just hold that movement there, and stay there, and then wait that, make that burn out, and then can you move through that movement, okay, can you go through from the sort of stance phase of what Claire was talking about, and can you get that movement going and still maintain that strengthening through there. So that's a really nice one we use for runners. And then obviously for hip extension on one leg, we then start going to like a single leg glute hip thrust, okay, to try and get the power of hip extension, which is gonna be that movement through there, lying down, obviously, um, and it also works on their pelvic stability. So when they are pushing through, they're also thinking about what are they doing at their hips? So if I go down into this position and I'm gonna push through here, I wanna make sure I'm not dropped. Okay, so there's a lot of things to think about when we're doing these exercises. Um, and then this sort of thing here, which is your hip flexion with a loaded band. So this is working on strengthening your hip flexors up in a running position. So the band is behind me and I'm working on trying to get into that movement, teaching my brain when I lift my leg up, my opposite arms up, and if I've got some band load there, I'm gonna get some strengthening work here. So a lot of these exercises target muscle groups, but we're also trying to target them to what the runner is doing on the day, or on the field, if you like. So we're trying to get it very, very specific to that movement. So you can see there's a lot there, okay? And that's just a few things, okay? Some people who are injured will be doing uh, different things on different days, depending on how many problems they've got going on. Then we move the hips. Now you can see like, so, sorry, move the knee and calf. What's more important, back and hips, or knee and calf, knee and ankle? Right, we can see that already. But there's more importance placed on spinal and core and hips than there is on knee and ankle. The injuries are happening at the knees and the ankles, mostly, but the causes are up here. And that's what we try and focus on. So knee control, we want to work on some step downs, some similar deadlifts, and some physio lunges. The step down is working on trying to get, can you single leg squat without your knee rolling inwards? Okay, training the brain under no load because it's just their body weight. Training the brain to try and keep that knee in line, in control, and stop rolling in, if they are rolling in. It's a very good exercise. Same sort of thing, but this is working on hamstring bias, so working on, can they work on hamstring work, standing on one leg, okay? And then can they 
go into more of a running type lunge pattern and work on making sure their glute is doing the work, loading down through their foot and pushing back, which helps teach them to load that midfoot load response, okay, pushing through, driving through the heel, making muscles work that they need when they're running. And then last one's is calf and foot strength. Now, when they're doing calf raises, um, a lot of people are just doing you know, calf raises off the floor or just standing vertical. Obviously, we want to try and have them going forward a little bit, so that little bit of angle forward to teach them when they do a calf raise, they're on that five to 10 degrees angle forward from the ankle, not from the hips, it's from the ankle. So we teach them to do a calf raise in that position, like the push off position, okay, it's more relative to what they're doing when they run. The soleus is obviously one that's, well not obviously, but also obviously for us, but for you guys, this is one that's forgotten quite a bit. Okay, it's a bent knee calf raise. So it's working on muscles that, or muscle, I should say, that is not part of the knee joint, okay? So your gastroc here, we keep a straight knee because the gastrocs hook up into the femur. This one here, the muscle only goes sort of to about here. So we have a bent knee with this one. So your knee is bent when you do a calf raise and it stays bent and that will bias the strengthening lower down in the calf. And obviously, arch lifts. Now, arch lifts are probably like neck exercises where they're the most non-compliant exercise in the world and people hate doing them. This is trying to get, this is Fran's lovely foot here, this is trying to get improvements in strength and brain control to the muscles of the foot. Because many people don't think about it and as we get older or if we've already started off with pretty flat feet, as we get older they're going to get probably even flatter. That can be losing the strength here as we get older over time and too much load can be the cause of why you're getting plantar fascia problems in that foot or tibialis posterior inflammation or tendinopathies in that ankle or shin splints in that shin because of that foot collapsing down. So we work on trying to get arch height in these exercises which are very specific and have to be sort of taught by a physio which is not scrunching the foot but it's actually about bringing the metatarsal head closer to the heel. Tricky stuff, but we can go through that later on. So that is your strengthening exercises. Like I said, a lot of focus on this area, but that's what we want to focus on with a lot of our injured athletes. Um, would you do your mobility exercises before or after your strength training? Probably before. If you're, if you're dealing with something that is tight, like because if you can do some strengthening work and loosen yourself up, you're probably going to be able to do the strengthening work a little bit more efficient, a bit better. Okay, and if you've got a little bit of pain from the tightness, if you can dissipate that before you do the strengthening work, you're probably going to access muscles that are either, if they're not working because of pain, you'll be able to access them a little bit better. We try and get that done first off, but definitely don't sacrifice your time by doing mobility over strength. If your time window is poor and you're going, I'm going out for a run in half an hour, if your stretches take half an hour, I would probably swap that around and do your strengthening work. To get that done first, then come home and do your mobility and maybe stretch out what has become tight from the run. Okay? But ideally, in an ideal world, we have heaps of time and we all have this wonderful two hours before we could run and we do all our exercise and work and then we go off for this beautiful run and don't get injured. But I would definitely um, try and do it beforehand. If you're running out of time, it's a strengthening. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. No worries.